If you're thinking that what we really want to do is eliminate poor neighborhoods, we want to make poor neighborhoods mixed income or middle class neighborhoods, you by definition, if you're trying to uplift a place and make a place better for people living there, you need some gentrification or that's not going to happen. Otherwise, you're basically saying that place is poor and ought to always be poor. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Dom. Before I introduce this week's guest, Seth Kaplan, some quick announcements. As I mentioned last week, I've announced some more retreats for the Unspeakeasy. So uh, this year, we will be in a number of cities, Austin, Los Angeles, Louisville, Kentucky, Seattle, Toronto, and Woodstock, New York. If you are a member of the online community, we'll also be doing some community retreats in places that uh, we're not going to announce publicly, but will be just for you guys. And uh, yeah, speaking of guys, I am working on it. I am working on a possible co-ed retreat. So bear with me on that. And in the meantime, if you are a non-guy and you want to get in on the Unspeakeasy, go to theunspeakeasy.com. Also, I will be doing a literary event talking about my book, The Unspeakable, which uh, was a book that came out in 2014. And this podcast is named after it. I'll be talking about that and, you know, other stuff having to do with writing in Austin, Texas on February 29th. And that is an event put on by Moon Tower Minion. So you can find out about that on my Substack page or go to moontowerminion.com. Okay, this week, I'm talking with Seth Kaplan. Seth has worked throughout the world, especially in developing nations, and is an expert on what's known as fragile states, which, as he'll explain, has to do with regions that are held together only precariously, thanks to corrupt government, weak infrastructure, and overall lack of public trust. In his new book, Fragile Neighborhoods, Seth looks at the way this precarity plays out in certain regions of the United States and explores how and why people living just a few miles from one another can have entirely different life experiences and even different life expectancies by a lot because of the social fabric of their neighborhoods. And he'll define what he means by social fabric. Seth talks about visiting neighborhoods all over the country, from rural Kentucky to inner city Detroit, and finding out what does and does not work when it comes to lifting people out of poverty. He talks about why West Coast cities seem so much more prone to political unrest and concentrated homelessness than East Coast cities. And finally, what he looked for in a neighborhood when he moved his own family from New York City to another state. As is the new way of things, free subscribers, and that would be you if you are hearing this right now, get the first part of this conversation for free. That's about 40 minutes in this case. If you want to hear the entire thing and there's about 25 more minutes, become a paying subscriber at megandom.substack.com. In the meantime, here's my interview with Seth Kaplan. Seth Kaplan, welcome to The Unspeakable. My pleasure to be here, Megan. So there's a lot of discussion these days about things like loneliness epidemics, deaths of despair, lack of social connections, extended families living apart. There's a lot of talk about what's happening on our city streets, obviously, with regard to homelessness, crime, quality of living generally. But you do something different in your new book, Fragile Neighborhoods. You talk about all of this in terms of neighborhoods, literal zip codes. So let's just start right here. What made you want to take that approach? A couple of reasons. First, I am attuned from my years of working in fragile states that whatever is going on in a country ultimately depends on the nature of relationships. And I have a strong belief that affects all my work that relationships are central to the health of any society. So I I was looking when I started doing this research, where in American society are the relationships the most broken? And where have they decayed? I think, I think if we have lots of lots of social problems 
And you, you mentioned several of them, but you could talk about mistrust polarization. You could talk about declining health, inequality, racism, everything. It's all about relationships. And yet something has gotten much worse in our relationships. So if I take that as my lens and I spend a lot of time looking and then you get and you dig into some of the data. And of course, you just walk around, walk around Baltimore, walk around parts of Washington near where I live, walk around just about any place, city in particular, but any part of America, you see great, great differences in how people are living and how people are experiencing life based upon where they live. And then you look at that data and there is an over 40 year difference in lifespan, average lifespan, just based upon your neighborhood. And I could go on to social mobility, health, opportunity. So I think we are all experiencing this country of ours in very different ways, just based upon what neighborhood we're living in. And that seemed like the central theme that I needed to focus on in my work. What do we mean when we say fragile state? Fragile states, the simple way to understand it is politically unstable, prone to violence. That would be the simplest way to look at the term or think about the term. If there's a roughly 200 countries in the world and roughly one third of them, 60 to 70, are prone to violence, political instability, they have coups, they can't run an election, they might be authoritarian, uh, mostly people are poor, and um, politics, even daily life, and I could describe more what that means, daily life itself is unpredictable. And so I have worked on these countries for over 15 years. And I think the, the key thing to uh, understand about my work is that my work would be considered peace building or conflict prevention or peacemaking, roughly in the peace field. And that's where I understand this importance about relationships and then the institutions that shape relationships. And that's really what all my work is about. Okay. And I don't know exactly how old you are or how long you've been working, but in just listening to you talk, I'm wondering if there was like a point at which you started to sort of look around your own country here in the U.S. and think like, oh, (laughs) is is this looking more like some of the fragile states that I have visited in other countries? And and I wonder if that's the case, when might that have occurred for you? It's very clear. I started, I consider life like a series of journeys. So I I had many journeys in my life. My journey on this quest to understand and find ways to help or contribute to the United States started, I can date it, 2015, 2016, 2017, when I'm having coffee in Washington, like a regular thing, you go around talking to your friends, your network, and people repeatedly, not once, not twice, but we're talking six, seven, eight times, they all asked me, is America becoming a fragile state? And when that happened, like month after month and over and over again, it just, I I had to stop. I had to think, I had to take a step back and I had to think really hard. I couldn't answer them. I mean, we're not Sri Lanka. We're not Nigeria, places that I would go to typically. And uh, we're not going to have a civil war tomorrow. Uh, Our government is not going to collapse. And yet so many people were anxious. So many people were worried. We look at our politics. I had to answer the question. And that's where I started this journey into America to figure out what is going on uh, with our society. And what kinds of examples were they citing? Because you say 2015, 2016, 2017. Okay, there's a big difference between 2015 and 2017 for, for one big obvious reason. So like, you know, I'm assuming before the Trump era, if somebody was sitting there having coffee with you in 2015, what were they pointing to specifically? Oh, I, I think it's all about Trump because it's basically, if you think 2015, second half of the year, He's doing very well, Mm -hmm. and people are really worried about how can so many people support him. And then he starts to win the primary, and then, of course, he wins the general election. So I think, I I mean, you have to imagine people in Washington, they live in a different world than most Americans live in, and they may not notice the alienation, the anger. I don't think they even noticed the fact that over 100,000 Americans die 
every single year from drug overdose, which is an incredible number. Twice as many people that died in the Civil War die every year, not the Civil War, die in the Vietnam War. Over 20 years, die in a single year in the United States from drug overdose. I don't think people notice how people in many parts of the country experience life, but they do notice when someone like Trump gets a lot of support and then eventually wins the election. So I think this is all about their anxiety about Trump and then their anxiety and the related issues about why is polarization so high in America? Why is there such distrust between people over politics? I think it's all about that change in the dynamics that affected why they would ask me this question. Okay, so what was your first stop when you embarked on this journey to answer this question? Well, for me, when you want to understand a country, it's really important that you don't start with politics. I know most people, they look at politics, they look at the headline news in terms of cultural wars or where people are fighting. For me, if you really want to understand a country, you got to get under the surface, you got to dig deeper. And politics for me is never the cause and never the answer. It's downstream from what is going on in society. So for me, of course, I wanted to visit lots of places. I wanted to, I went to Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, Appalachia. I went to Detroit. I went to Louisiana and I wandered and I interviewed people and I read. And of course you read a lot. You don't read books on contemporary politics. You read about society. You read about how people are living you read about uh, what people are thinking about society. And I think if you're, if you're assuming, as I assume, that politics is downstream from society, you have to ask what has changed so dramatically in society, what has changed so dramatically in our relationships that lead us to the politics. So I think most people, when they get scared of politics, they're looking for an answer in politics. And I would say, That's not where I want to go. I want to say what is happening in our society, in our relationships that are producing that outcome in politics. Okay, so what's the most salient example? I mean, you mentioned drug addiction. I mean, we can look at we can look at lots of data. If you want to look at data, so so um, I mean, the drug overdose, uh, the deaths of despair. You can look at rising depression. You can look at rising mental illness, and of course. For some people, you're looking at, this is why I focus on neighborhoods, you're looking at place-based inequality. I would even say place-based exclusion. I mean, we've always had it with redlining and uh, the way Blacks have been treated historically. But what you have today, and you've had in recent decades, is you've had so many things. You know, Companies have nationalized, shopping has sort of nationalized these chain stores. What you have is, is that there are many places Think of rural areas, think of some parts of cities, think of there's lots of parts of America that are they don't feel any ownership in society. They don't feel included in society. But I also think on a more national scope, you have uh, life. The biggest change in life is that people used to feel a sense of belonging because they knew their neighbors and they were involved personally and often taking leadership or volunteer roles in lots and lots of local associations. And today there's like this void. I mean, mostly there's individuals. There's not a lot of local associations. You may not have a local school. You may not have a local church. You may not have a local shopping experience. You may not have a local association. And so there are places that are economically and socially thriving. There are places that are doing okay economically or even well economically, but they are very isolating. And people are, society has been very atomized. And you can see that in the data on depression and other, I mean, you can look at materially well-off kids that are simply unhappy with the way their lives are going and uh, their pessimism and their depression and all types of things like that. And so if you think of America as this horizontal landscape with lots and lots of different places, what you're seeing is that for many Americans, they're not very happy and and they're taking this out on politics, in my yeah. opinion. 
Yeah. Well, so let's um, talk about Appalachia for a little bit here. So Appalachia is a huge, that encompasses several states and it's a, you know, gigantic kind of swath of America. You talk about Kentucky specifically, Appalachian Kentucky, which consists of 54 counties and 1.2 million people. You have a remarkable sentence here. You write, on a macro level, Appalachia's socioeconomic landscape may have more in common with developing countries like Colombia and Brazil that struggle to improve their disadvantaged position in the global economy. So can you tell me what your time was like in Kentucky? What kinds of people did you talk with? What kinds of stories did they share with you? So first, let me say that um, I think this is a very underrated part of the country. I was struck by how beautiful the landscape was. Yes, absolutely. I was there in, uh, I believe it was late November, early December. This is right before COVID. And uh, I mean, just the hills, uh, the mountains, the fact that the clouds were very low, so it was like fog. Just the physical landscape was beautiful. Of course, no one ever thinks of going there for tourism or to experience, to have some joyful time there. But I was struck by how beautiful the place was. And I was also struck by the people. The people were extremely humble, extremely down to earth, extremely friendly. And uh, I'm from New York. And I wouldn't say any of those things about New Yorkers. Sorry to tell you that. Really? I I think New Yorkers are friendly. They talk a lot. um, They interact a lot. They talk a lot. lot. They interact (laughs) a lot. But they're also, I mean, I'm from New York. And I'm sure a lot of people think I'm obnoxious. So um, I don't think people would say too much about uh, people from Eastern Kentucky being obnoxious. But (laughs) so I I would just say I had a very good experience. So I happen to have someone who ran a great uh, large education initiative in that part of the state. And that was my guide. And she was great, Dreema Gentry. And Dreema and I spent many days driving up and down, meeting people, talking to people, visiting schools, visiting some government officials, visiting um, families. And I was just trying, I mean, as always, I like to have a lot of data points. I like to see a large number of people. I like to go into homes and everything to get a feel, walk around downtown areas, which mostly are, are not doing very well in, in this place. And I was just struck by, I was struck by many things. I was struck by the, the great uh, loss of population. There were schools I went to in which the student population had dropped by, I would say, half or even more over a relatively short period of time. I was struck by some of the data. There were counties in which so many of the parents had problems with drugs or had gotten themselves into, uh, probably related to drugs, had gotten themselves into jail, that I think it was 25% of the students did not necessarily know where they were sleeping on a regular basis. 25%? I mean, these are just incredible. It was some incredible number like that, that they basically were sleeping not in a home, basically not in their own home or some number like that, basically because their family they could, they, whatever they couldn't afford to wherever they lived, the parents were had gone to jail or something like that. We have to go back and look at this. But there was some number, like about a quarter of the of the kids, were not in a stable home situation. And that's not about one parent being gone. It's simply about parents going to jail or parents on drugs. And uh, so the kind of experience that people are having there are are certainly unlike me with my materially well off. A thriving neighborhood. Everything is so different and the challenges are so great. And I think people don't have high expectations. But when I talk about the comparison to the developing world, I mean, the mines were owned by outsiders. The policies that closed the mines and cost a lot of people their jobs were decided by outsiders. So people there, they mostly feel that they're powerless and things are being done to them by people in New York or people in Washington. And you wonder why they're mistrustful and angry. I mean, I don't think, I think some of this anger, it's like common sense. Go out, see people are experiencing life and what's happening to them. And I think you also would be angry. So for me, this, this whole experience, again, you have to, you have to meet people where they are and understand what they're experiencing to understand how they view the world. Yeah. Did this start like in the 80s or the 90s? I mean, when did this really start to shift? Like th- these people, these kids who they don't know where they're going to sleep that night, where would these kids have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago? What's the timeline? 
Well, I think you're talking about multiple waves, so it's hard to put in. I mean, if I mean the war on poverty, there's a famous event or picture. I've I've seen the picture of Lyndon B. Johnson going to. I think it was probably West West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and I think part of Tennessee would be Central Appalachia, which is easily the worst part of Appalachia. North and South are not doing nearly as bad. And there's this scene where he goes to West Virginia. So you're talking the mid 60s when there's an attempt to do something about this area. But I I would say the big devastation we see now is because of a couple of things that have happened in, let's say, the last 15 or 20 years. One is the closure of mines, which and uh, basically the loss of economic opportunity, which forced those that were maybe the leaders or the ones with better education or more prospects or a better social network, it forced a certain group of people out of the region. And it basically left a lot of people behind. And then you have the whole thing with the drugs, the drugs starting with opioids and now with fentanyl and other things. And this was ground zero for um, the great increase in deaths from drugs and o- and overdoses. And I would say this combination, economic, and I have to think there's a social, the, the weakening of the social fabric plays a role in the drug overdoses. Something about this combination, it's like a one-two punch and the region is struggling to get up from the floor type of thing. Yeah. And I, I know you're not an expert in the o- opioid epidemic, and, and I don't want to dwell on Appalachia for too long here because you go all over the place. But uh, do you know why it took hold in this region? Um, I mean, I think there's many reasons. I mean, there's certainly authors who have dug into this much more than myself. And I, I, I think you can point to, again, multiple causes. One is the great change in the supply we have a much more potent, inexpensive, easy to access drug than ever before. And that took that's basically been the big change over the last 20 or 25 years. There's been waves of improvements in the supply such that it it's it's like in such places it's everywhere. It's hard to imagine. I mean, I've read books on this. I can't say I'm an expert. So one thing is the change in the supply. Certainly a second thing is on the demand side, a loss of hope a despair. Some of this started because, of course, people's jobs are painful and the whole healthcare system. I think this is one of the prom- the challenges. Me with my foreign eyes, a person who lived outside the country for years, one of the interesting or you might say depressing things about America is that we always look for quick solutions to problems that often are complicated. And the way we've dealt with people's pain, whatever that pain might be, has often been to medicate. And so I think there was certainly people in pain. There was an attempt to medicate. The medicated created addiction. And um, you have that part. You have the part of simply the social fabric decaying, the economic landscape decaying, weakening of relationships all over our country makes lots of populations more vulnerable. So I would say there's, there's a technical part there's a supply part. There's something about what we're doing in terms of our choices as a society. And then I think what most interests me, because I'm focused on relationships, is the tearing of the social fabric and how that makes people much more vulnerable and much harder to climb out of holes. One of the problems we have in our country is that people begin to get into holes. We don't have the social fabric to support them, and they tend to get deeper and deeper and a country with a stronger social fabric, we would be saving a lot more of those people than we are currently. How do you define social fabric? Um, I don't think there's a fixed definition. I would define it by- <laughs> Look it up in the dictionary. Not, there, if you look it up, no, I, I, think, I think you would get 20, 20 different <laughs> yeah. definitions. How do you define it? I define it the, the web of institutions, and this is formal, informal. Informal is like, the families on your street. They just know each other. They talk to each other. They see each other. I could give examples of my neighborhood, but all the web of relationships and institutions around you. In my neighborhood, I feel like I'm, I have a security blanket like supporting me that I literally feel joyful when I walk down the street. 
I feel happiness. I know the faces. I know the people. They may not be friends, but I can I have I can give 20 examples of me asking for something and someone's there and vice versa. And so it's this web of relationships and an abundance of institutions that you're embedded in, that you're a part of, that makes you, that's a social fabric that gives you a positive feeling. It also protects you when you're down and supports you when you want to climb. And we used to have that mostly everywhere. And today we mostly don't have it. And that is the big change in our society. Mm. Yeah, I want to make sure we talk about how you decided where to live. I think this is fascinating. But before before we get to that, let's jump to maybe some of the other regions that you visited. I mean, I'm especially curious, you know, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about addiction. Obviously, this happens in urban neighborhoods. We see with, you know, minority populations, people of color, black neighborhoods, there's the same kind of stuff is going on. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how this stuff manifests differently, like in inner city, urban neighborhood that's very poor. How are the people experiencing their poverty differently than white rural people experience poverty? Well, I I think in urban, you often have a a very different history. So many, many, I I don't think I would say all, but many of the urban neighborhoods are a product of redlining. So there was systematic underinvestment by government and private capital. And um, there's even to the extent because of the power dynamics. So even when we're post-civil rights, they're still maybe less because of racism, but because of power dynamics with possibly a racial undertone or over to whatever you want to think about it is that there's more polluting, more pollution in those streets. There's fewer parks in those streets. There might be fewer libraries. So there's a whole, I would say, different history behind the urban. I, I think that um, in Appalachia, they will tell you that they are often discriminated against by people elsewhere in the country, by how they dress or how they talk. And I can't believe it's as anywhere near as bad as what African-Americans or Blacks experience. But you certainly have a very different history. And, uh, And so to some extent, the policies need to be tremendously different. The advantage, I would say, of an urban area, I mean, some urban areas like a Detroit, where I write, where I also spend time, The government has very little resources and the challenges it faces are so many. So it could do a tremendous job. But in urban areas, you tend to have many more institutions. You tend to have more philanthropy. You tend to have much more. uh, It's like in your face. It's hard to ignore when you're in a place like Eastern Kentucky. In some places, except for the school, except for the county government and a couple of churches, there are no institutions. There is no philanthropy. People are just all alone. So in some ways, it's a harder challenge. But I certainly think urban, the urban problem challenges are also tremendously great. So it's it's very hard to compare. They're just very different types of challenges. Yeah. And I would think if you are in a poor urban area, there's still a chance you could get into a better school. Like there are programs. If you understand the system enough to at least maybe get your kid sent to a different kind of school. At least that school is there somewhere. Like can get I, on the I would say, like, that. again, that depends a lot on the, fa- I mean, the, the challenge you have, yes. of course, in all these places is family stability. Right. And um, some sort of, I would also say inter-family dynamics. So if you, if you have a strong family unit and you have uh, parents who are on the lookout, look out, I think you have many more organizations, opportunities, the schools being one of them, that you can look to. We have waves of immigrants that come to this country very poor and end up in very poor neighborhoods. And within one generation, they do well for themselves and they've escaped. But if you go to some of these places, and I think Appalachia has some of the similar problems today, you have challenges of, I would say not only family dynamics, you also have, you have very weak social networks. And you have, so you might, even if you thought of some of those ideas, you might not know where to start. You don't have the information, you don't have the knowledge, and you don't have any network, and you're really much working on your own. So people have a, have a, 
have a high hurdle to climb or to overcome, even if that is possible for some of those families. Yeah. And I would also think just the topography and the geography of the place would be a factor because I I would imagine just walking around, like that has to be like, you know, at least a point or two in the social fabric column. Like even if your neighborhood is extremely unsafe and has absolutely no, you know, very few resources and has a lot of crime, at least you're interacting with people. I mean, the time that I've spent in in rural areas in the South and the Midwest, you're just in your car all the time. (laughs) Um, You're not, you're not out and about, like there isn't the sort of, well, actually let me think about this. There used to be like the, the public square, right? In a small town, but America is so diverse. Yeah, it's really yeah. hard to, it's yeah. really hard. But I, I would just say if you're like in one of those poor neighborhoods in Baltimore and the housing stock is very deteriorated and some are boarded up and the school choices are pretty miserable, you got a bunch of nonprofits there to help you, but you may have many, many levels of challenges to overcome. And the situation, the, the scene itself on a day to day basis just might be depressing. So I I wouldn't underestimate the challenges that people have in some of these neighborhoods. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm I'm being a New Yorker about this because I'm thinking about, uh, (laughs) like, you know, Harlem is not that far from, you know, the Upper East Where are you from in New York, Megan? (laughs) Since you brought up the topic, we have to ask. Where are you from? Well, I didn't grow up there, but I have spent a lot of time living there and living in Washington Heights, actually, most, most recently. And that's a neighborhood that's changed a lot. That's changed a lot. Um, yeah. My mother lived there, so I've been there, not currently, but I've been there many, many times. And uh, you get off on the subway, and if you go to the west exit versus the east exit, you feel like you're in two different worlds. So even there, you get different neighborhoods. You go to the south exit, you're like in a different neighborhood. So it's uh, it's uh, changed a lot, but it's also incredibly diverse. Yeah, I mean, it was d- depending on if you're in the the upper part of Washington Heights, it was very Jewish, um, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, and then it was very black, and now it's it's mixed. And yeah, anyway, um, so so what kinds of conversations were you having with people in, say, urban Detroit? What were they telling you about their lives? Well, in Detroit, I uh, researched a great organization, Life Remodeled, Chris Lambert, and I spent a lot of time. Because here's a guy who had this great idea, build a neighborhood hub in a neighborhood that certainly needed it. And he went in and he got this opportunity and he thought it would be great. And he had been working for 10 years in poor areas of the city. And he thought people would be very excited by his initiative. And what he learned was they didn't trust him. And it wasn't what he was bringing. It was about this Trust is not something you ever can assume. And he he was beautifying streets and he was giving people, repairing roofs and he was giving people new boilers and doing good things, giving people stuff and then taking over what he was, he was taking over a middle school, a beautiful middle school and turning into a neighborhood hub. He was becoming their neighbor. He was getting the best asset in that, in that area and the neighbors, the neighbors being black and him being a white guy from outside the area, they were very mistrustful. So what I found very interesting about Detroit was what I learned about racial relationships. I learned a lot about outsiders versus insiders. I learned a lot about what it actually means. I mean, it was a great case, the four, five, six steps he had to take to break bread, to recruit locals into his staff, to build to make connections with the leaders in the community and build advisory boards, all the things that you have to do to build trust in a low trust environment. I mean, there's so much to learn there. And I mean, Detroit has had a really hard 50, 60 years. And, uh, but it's also a great laboratory for social experiments and social initiatives. And um, I just found it very, very um, educational learning from people in Detroit. A lot of great people. A lot of people very down to earth, very much willing to get their hands dirty and build back the city its strength. Mm-hmm. And is it working? Uh, what what this specific initiative? I mean, Detroit has stabilized. Detroit uh, lost two thirds of its population. If you ever drive around Detroit, you feel like you're in a post war situation. Some neighborhoods are gone. Some neighborhoods have a few houses left. They may be decaying or 
There's people even building farms in the middle of the city because there's so much open space. And so I think Detroit has stabilized and made some progress, but it has a very long way to go. In terms of this guy, this Chris Lambert and Life Remodeled, I mean, he learned a lot. And from everything I could tell, he's very successful. He's certainly built trust. He brought in 39 organizations. So this is a neighborhood that was very poor, that had basically very little of anything. And here you have lots of opportunities for after-school jobs, after-school mentoring, after-school training, as well as health services, as well as job placement services. Uh, And so this went from a this became a neighborhood with a, a certain amount of an institutional abundance. Again, I'm always thinking about institutions. And because he was building trust, he was able to build networks of trust. So I think the potential for him to make a big improvement in people's lives in that area is huge. And I think he's already doing it. So how did he overcome people's mistrust with him just being a white guy? Was it just by sheer perseverance? He just kept doing stuff effectively? I mean, the most important thing, and I see this in my work in peace building, you got to have face time. You got to sit down. You got to show up over and over again. You got to uh, spend time together. You got to break bread together. And you got to um, you got to give people a sense of of that this thing that you're doing, it's actually them doing it to themselves. It's, they have an ownership stake. They have agency they're leading it. So he basically ended up, it was an organization full of outsiders. Eventually the organization has a name, Durfee Innovation Society, that the locals gave it. I think the local students, it has staff. Many of the staff now are locals or from nearby neighborhoods. He has advisory boards. He chose as his three biggest priorities, priorities that the neighborhood wanted. So he did a whole process over a period of time. You know, what we learn from this is we often want to do something and then we think about how to do it. But actually what matters before that is the who and the when before the what and the how. And the who is who is involved and what are my relationship to them. And the when is we got to spend a lot of time building a certain level of trust. We got to build that foundation what I would call some sort of relational foundation, either because of what I'm doing or at the neighborhood level before we can get into the what and the how. And I think most policies or nonprofits or philanthropy, they're all focused on the what and the how. They're basically forgetting the people and the people is what it's all about. And the people should be central to everything we do. Yeah, I want to ask you about gentrification. So like, you know, you're talking about Detroit and I feel like, I don't know, maybe within the last 10 years, maybe not the last few years, but 10 years ago, I was reading a lot about like sort of white hipsters moving in from different places in the country and buying like really cheap old houses, old beautiful houses that had come into disrepair for like, you know, nothing, you know, like $5,000 or $10,000 or something and trying to rebuild these neighborhoods. And and I feel like I recall that it sort of didn't work. Uh, so I, I wonder if you sort of know about that phenomenon, either in terms of Detroit itself or just more broadly, like what, what are we, what are we feeling about gentrification these days as a concept? So I think gentrification is often maligned. And I think gentrification of a certain sort is very positive and doesn't deserve to be maligned. You can have gentrification in which outsiders move in, buy a property, remodel, renovate, and shove basically everyone who was there before out. And that is something that I think uh, a lot of people would think is not really fair especially if the people coming in are white and the people being pushed out are black or or another minority. Mm-hmm. But if you're thinking that what we really want to do is eliminate poor neighborhoods, we want to make poor neighborhoods mixed income or middle class neighborhoods, you by definition, if you're trying to uplift a place and make a place better for people living there, you need some gentrification or that's not going to happen. Otherwise, you're basically saying that place is poor and ought to always be poor. And if a place is going to incrementally, over time, gradually become not poor, certainly part of that is there's going to be better housing. 
there's going to be an influx of some people. And uh, I mean, there will be some turnover of people in a very poor neighbor neighborhood. There's a turnover of 20, 25 percent of the people every year, actually. So some of that is natural. So I, I would say there's a form of positive gentrification, which is almost a prerequisite if you're going to uplift neighborhoods so that they become thriving. I just think you have to think of a way to do that in a way that you don't discriminate against or shove out or push out the people who are already living there. Some of them will leave naturally. They leave one out of four are leaving every year. But if you don't, if you don't have an influx and you don't have an uplift, you're basically condemning people that are always live in a poor neighborhood. And that certainly is not what we ought to be aiming for. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me if they are renters, it's going to be a big problem for them. If they happen to own their property and the area gets gentrified, then they're in luck, I guess. I mean, I mean, that would be one of the, I mean, in many of these neighborhoods, what you have is older people who own and you have younger people that are more transient. I mean, I've heard of schools in these neighborhoods in which the, the student population will turn over by 50% in a year. How can you improve wow. a school like that? It's impossible. But I just know the transient rate, you could tell the health of a neighborhood partly on the turnover rate. A healthy neighborhood has about a 5% turnover rate. An unhealthy neighborhood has a 20, 25% turnover rate. For I mean, there's many causes and outcomes of that. So I think if you're going to gentrify and you ought to have some policy where you enable people who live there to have a stake in the gentrification so that they're building wealth from the process. And you would want initiatives to do that side by side with initiatives that created more middle income as well as high quality, low income housing, as well as amenities and other things to make this a positive. You want to make every neighborhood a positive experience you're going to have some gentrification. The question is, how do you do that in a way that's fair to uh, to the current residents? Well, and how do you do that? How do you give someone a stake in the neighborhood when they are not a property owner? Well, I, I, that's why I would say you would have an initiative. I mean, I, I don't talk about it at length, but I mention it briefly because my book is very focused on social, not economic. But there's an organization I know that started in Germantown outside of Philadelphia and it, it was started by a real estate investor, a guy with a lot of money, who thought that this would be a great initiative to help people. And what he basically does is he doesn't only uh, provide training to people on basically real estate. You think people who are poor, I mean, one of the things they lack is they lack skills on anything to do with real estate. They lack maybe knowledge about the value sometimes of owning and investing in your property and in your neighborhood. So he, he provides a lot of training, but and he goes beyond that, which very few other people do. He provides uh, a way for them to get access to capital. So he's providing basically a full package of services so that people in Germantown, and I think they started in a couple of other uh, neighborhoods, that these people can own, these people can improve, these people can buy lots, and to some extent, the gentrification is being driven internally as opposed to externally, which I think is the ideal scenario. Even if it's driven internally, there's going to be a lot of people that don't contribute uh, or and don't gain from it and might even leave. But you're going to have a certain percentage of the population that will have a stake and they will actually be the drivers of gentrification and they will be the biggest beneficiaries because they would have started the process early. Okay, that makes sense. That's that is. I think that's called German. I think it's called jump, some sort of jump something Germantown. We would have to look up the exact okay. name. But yeah, it's, I, like, uh, it's, I like that. Okay, so I want to read from you this tweet that I saw recently. I don't know who this person is. I'm not going to name them, but they say <laughs> I don't know how. I'm just going to read the tweet. I'm not. This is not coming from me. So this says the gentrification cycle in five stages, and they've put gentrification in quotes. One, locality has affordable housing near economic opportunity. Poor, educated young people move in. Okay, so I guess that's sort of like in the in the distant past. Okay, two, gays move in. Gay people move in, making locality increasingly hip. Rents, property values begin to rise. Order improves. That was the first part of my conversation with Seth Kaplan. To hear the rest, go to megandom.substack.com and become a paying subscriber. 
Seth is a leading expert on fragile states. He is a lecturer in international studies at Johns Hopkins University and senior advisor for the Institute for Integrated Transitions. His book is Fragile Neighborhoods, Repairing American Society One Zip Code at a Time. Once again, if you're interested in those new Unspeakeasy retreats, go to theunspeakeasy.com. If you want to come see me in Austin on February 29th, go to moontowerminion.org. I think I said .com at the top of the show when I mentioned this. It's .org. I think you'd probably find it in any case, but just heads up. You can also check my Substack page about that. Again, to hear the rest of this conversation, also go to that Substack page and become a paying subscriber. I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>